Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar uh, titled Commerce Everywhere. It's going to be a very insightful panel discussion, uh, which I'm really looking forward to. We've great speakers um, flying in from across the, the waters. Um, so many thanks for joining us. I know there's a couple more um, streaming in there now over the next uh, minute or two. So um, just before we start the panel, I want to just bring in Kevin Purcell. He's the CX Sales Specialist for Ireland with SAP. Really knowledgeable guy. And he's just going to give a brief, really brief, four minute quick overview of what SAP can offer to retailers here in Ireland. Uh, so Kevin, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Keenan. Lovely to join you all today. Thanks for having me. Great. So uh, we'll, we'll let you share your slides there. You'll be able to You'll be able to knock mine off there in a minute. Cool, okay. Can you see my slides all right? No. No, there we go. They're just starting there now. Perfect. Okay, brilliant. I'll just put on presentation mode and we're good to go. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks everyone. Um, so just to give you a quick five-minute overview of SAP, who we are, and applications that we provide in the retail space and perhaps some details of our Irish customers. So SAP, probably best known as an ERP customer, um, or sorry, provider uh, around accounts and financials and supply chain, but we also have a full customer experience suite of products. Um, so if you see there, Amars's marketing, so we provide marketing cloud, which provides omni-channel marketing across all different channels and personalization. We also have a service cloud, which provides uh, your chatbots, your live chats, your self-serve and your ticketing, everything you'd associate with what a customer support representative would need. And then beside that, we have our sales cloud, which is essentially for um, sales reps to manage their pipeline in a CRM. And then we have a loyalty offering as well, which provides online loyalty with in-store. The layer above that, you see Qualtrics. So not many people may know, but SAP actually acquired Qualtrics around two and a half years ago. And it's really important because it provides that customer experience management layer as well. So if you want to obtain valuable feedback from a customer, whether it's through a survey or an on-site pop-up, you can do that through Qualtrics experience management too. So importantly, we also have customer data cloud. So what's customer data cloud? So it basically provides a 360 degree view of the customer, which includes past purchases, product preferences, uh, platforms they're on, such as Facebook, Instagram, customer support queries, even down to their gender, how many children they have, how many email addresses, what their phone number is, and their preferred methods of payment. So it's really valuable information that's stored there as a central repository that I know all retailers want. Above that then, and the final product that I'll just touch on this quick overview is Commerce Cloud. So SAP Commerce Cloud, previously known as Hybris, is essentially the e-commerce platform that your uh, retail website is built on. Okay. And look, I'll just touch on some of the customers here now in Ireland, some well-known names that I'm sure you're all very familiar with, and just briefly some of the technology from SAP that they're using. So the likes of Smith's Toys, uh, so Smith's Toys is using SAP Commerce Cloud and also using Emarsis for the email marketing. Similar to that, Elvery Sports are using SAP Commerce Cloud for their website, personalization, omni-channel marketing, and also loyalty as well. Primark, so it's probably well publicized that uh, Primark don't actually transact online. Uh, potentially they will in the future, who knows? But they're using SAP technology for their website as well. So if you want to go on to the Primark website, look at the products they have in store, the promotions and so on, that's SAP technology, and they're also using SAP Marketing Cloud as well for email marketing. Uh, Glambia, another huge customer of SAP. There's a great partnership there spanning years. Probably best known, I suppose, for wholesale or manufacturing of dairy products. But they also have a very large retail arm as well, 
uh, an example of that would be the Body and Fit website, which would be uh, using SAP technology for their website as well. They also use SAP Service Cloud uh, for the customer support representatives and SAP Sales Cloud for their CRM, for their sales reps. And then some other notable retailers in Ireland there, you'll see the top right-hand corner, Brown, Thomas and Arnott's. They're using Emarsis, SAP Emarsis for their omni-channel marketing as well. And then look, my very last slide before we get into the panel discussion as well, it's just where we stand in the market. I suppose just wanted to call that out. So for the last consecutive 10 years, SAP Commerce has been in the top right-hand corner of the Gartner Quadrant uh, as one of the leaders and just a separate report specific to retail software. Uh, you'll see that IDC have recommended us as the top retail software provider in the world as well. So look, that was just a very high level snapshot uh, just to give you a little bit of idea of SAP CX commerce in the Irish retail marketplace. So uh, thanks very much for your time and Keelan, over back to you. That's great, Kevin. Appreciate that. Definitely under the four minute mark, I would say. <laughs> yeah. um, and in fairness, I didn't actually realize the, the, the amount of different offerings, you know, that SAP can provide to retail. So and who's using them is great. Great to get a bit of insight there. So fair play. Um, we'll just we'll bring in our main panel now. Um, so we're delighted to welcome Gemma Carver. She's the uh, Strategic CX Advisor with SAP based in the UK. And we've Zach Hermit Lowe. He's the region, Regional Vice President of Amarsis, uh, leading omnichannel customer engagement platform, uh, who both have years of experience uh, and look forward to sharing their insights. Um, so we'll just bring Gemma on there now. Great. Hi, Gemma. Welcome. Hi. Great. Um, maybe Gemma and Zach, if you want to briefly maybe give everyone a bit of background to yourselves and and your your history and, and where you've come from. And... Yeah, brilliant. Um, uh, I guess I'll go for a sec if that's okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Gemma Carver. Um, I am uh, based here in London, although you can probably still just about hear an Irish twang, although I've lived here quite a while. Um, so I, yeah, as um, as Keelan explained, I am the customer experience advisory lead for retail at SAP. So I lead a global team of uh, essentially consultants, really, and advisors. All of us were former CMOs, um, chief customer officers, or senior directors, predominantly at retailers or uh, CP uh, companies. So. We all come from the business side. We're not really technologists at all. Um, my own background um, is, is very heavily digital. So I have been group marketing director, um, as I said, CMO. I've run digital product teams and e-commerce teams across both pure play um, and, you know, omni-channel businesses. And my last role, which I'll probably talk a bit about, quite a bit about today, it, uh, was um, I was group uh, innovation and digital director for a company called Pentland Brands. Um, you probably don't know the name Pentland, but Pentland actually owns um, Speedo, but also Canterbury, Mitre, Berghaus, uh, lots of out sort of active and outdoor uh, brands. So my job was to um, primarily really kind of define what was the digital strategy for the whole of Pentland Brands, but with a big focus on building up the, the direct to consumer business. Um, because it has a big, uh, you know, sort of uh, wholesale arm as well. Um, so, yes, and I also run uh, all of their innovation as well. So, uh, yeah, I'll stop there, but uh, looking forward to uh, the conversation we're about to have. Great. Thanks, Gemma. Okay, thanks, Gemma. And, uh, and yeah, not, not, quite as, not, not quite as tenuous as, as Gemma in, in the industry, but I've been in the um, MarTech space for, for coming up to, to nine years. I'm now fortunate enough to be the the regional vice president for Amarsis, so overseeing our, our, our commercial and operational functions across the um, UK, Ireland, and the EMEA North function. And over the last nine years, um, I've also set up two e-commerce businesses. So I've set up uh, some smaller e-commerce businesses that have that have transitioned, as well as now spending the last couple of years, as well as helping and working at, at Amarsis, also consulting with various startup founders at, at operational and growth level, um, and then also working with some of our, our larger tier clients to look at 
how do they strategize their, their marketing output? So really here today to, to talk and, and support and, and give guidance and, and give you some insight into what some of our largest customers are doing. And, and we work globally with around two and a half thousand retail customers here at Masters. So hopefully somewhere in that, I have some, uh, I have some nuggets, I'm sure. Yeah, that's great. That's great, Zach. Really impressive, in fairness. Um, Gemma, maybe over to you if, if, um, if we want to maybe just discuss... Firstly, around the trends you're seeing, you know, with some of your larger clients and, and mm -hmm. I suppose the main pain points that they're working on and, and maybe the, the areas you're, you're leading them through at the minute. Yeah, so um, I guess just to give a little bit more background on, on sort of how we work. So uh, although I'm leading a team, I also most of my time is actually spent in, you know, working with customers um you know ad advising them on a whole bunch of things so so i work with mostly quite large customers so i don't know the mix of, of people listening in today but um you know the likes of boots uh car four i do a lot in grocery for some reason it's sort of it wasn't planned but it's it's happened that way so lots going on in grocery um uh actually some in fashion so jewels um in the uk i've done quite a bit of work with also tk max carhartt lots in the fashion apparel space as well um i would say the trends that i see now were the kind of the things that i guess you know two three years ago when i was working brand side and i was kind of pushing through a transformation of penfund um it, it's the same trends it, only more so if you like so if I were to pick one, I would say that the big one is this shift to customer experience. So, you know, the topic today is commerce everywhere, right? But, you know, the way that everybody thinks about commerce everywhere, it has certainly within the retail space, I've seen a real acceleration in that change. So what I mean about that is, um, you know, when I came into Pentland, for example, um, it was a fairly... Uh, fragmented setup in, within that business at the time with lots of brands operating in, in silos and running e-commerce and in fact multi-channel you know selling through retailers and marketplaces in a very siloed fragmented way and the problem with that is that it becomes super kind of transactional but which you know it's important that we are focused on on you know being commercial but what happens is that you kind of tend to lose sight then of what your customers your consumers actually need and in in brands in it, which have very specific uses like swimming for example so swimwear or rugby kits we, we actually actually ran the um irfu so the irish rugby union website as well um you really need to understand what is the experience of that player, whether it's amateur or elite, um, you know, how do they experience wearing your, your, um, your apparel or, you know, climbing that mountain or whatever to, to be able to then reflect that in the way that they buy. And so a lot of the work that I did at Pentland was around change in the way we thought about things. So we, we, I set a big, big goal, which was to triple the amount of um, uh, direct-to-consumer e-commerce revenue at Pentland at that time. But my approach was to say, okay, the way we're going to do is we're going to really start understanding how people want to buy from us, what they want. Obviously, product, physical product has a big bearing on whether people buy at all, but, um, you know, mostly we focus on that. So, I've seen a I've seen the big change. So we brought in things like product development teams, you know, design thinking, uh, massive focus on analytics, um, and you know, cut to the skip to the end. It was very successful. But I think what I've seen now is that trend really accelerating um, in the customers that I see, even the big ones with a lot of legacy. You are seeing that focus on CX on the customer, right, and just going out, talking to them, and then systematically breaking down the needs of that customer and translating those into technical solutions. Um, or, you know, that, that's, that's the really big one. I think the second one is more of a commercial trend that I'm seeing, which is um, a big push towards marketplaces. So, you know, you'll see the likes of Next, for example, are effectively becoming a marketplace. Jules, mm -hmm. who I've done, the fashion retailer, who I've done quite a bit of work with this year, they have their own marketplaces. You know, there are other large brands, retailers that I know of now who are looking to launch marketplaces. So 
there are two two aspects there's do you want to be on a marketplace yourself do you want to be present so I did a lot of work at Pentland getting us onto Zalando getting us onto um global fashion group places like that but then it's do I have the scale and the customers to be able to launch a marketplace myself? So there's big push towards that as businesses, as brands look for that greater reach, look to leverage the data and the customer base that they've built. And then the third thing, which I think Zach probably is going to have a good, a really good perspective on as well, is loyalty. Um, and, you know, we were chatting about it a bit the other day you know what does there's a real redefinition and a reorientation I think of what loyalty actually means in the market and so if you have a loyalty scheme lots of people I'm talking to now are looking at those loyalty programs and thinking are they are we giving consumers what they need now and that's that brings it right back to you know customer you know what does the customer want and really understanding your customer um so I'll pause there I feel like I've been talking for ages but um yeah, I'm sure Zach will have lots to say on, on those points as well. No problem. Yeah. Thanks, Jim. Over to you, Zach. No, no, c completely in agreement. And I think that they're, they're the three things that we've been seeing for a while. I think, actually, if you take point number one, which is, which is kind of really about the relationship with the customer, and you take point number three, which is about loyalty, they can very quickly almost kind of come full circle around one another. And I think... Certainly, as, as Gemma was saying, the relationship with customers changed. And for the past definitely 18 months, I think through, through, through lockdown, and we, it's always got to be a buzzword that we talk about COVID-19. Everyone does that on, on every single call these days. But what we have seen is we've seen brands focusing much more on the emotional connection that they have with customers, right? And how they engage with customers. It's less about continued throughput and it's more about um it's more about the relationship that they have and building the story with the brand two of our two of our most premium customers or two of our, our longest serving customers are a gym shark and, and lounge underwear both high growth very very quick startup businesses who effectively grew off of social media which is one of the if not the key place to create relationships where customers have an emotional attachment to you as a brand right and they're really really utilizing that moving forward and what we've seen and i'm sure Gemma has seen amongst the many many different opportunities is is a is a is definitely a movement away from your fast fashion led businesses where it is buy once put in the bin to something which is a lot more eco-friendly and has a lot more of a, a retained method and um, I know that lounge are going to move to, to fully, um, fully recycled materials pretty much as of at the end of this year. And that's something, again, that gives people now they feel happier about purchasing and they, they have a reason to go back. And I think that's so, so, so important. And something which is uh, which is definitely on the lips of, of customers. Mm, the, yeah. the loyalty piece that, that plays into that again, and, and I think actually Gemma and I were, were speaking and loyalty probably has its its whole other other area but we're actually seeing a lot of, of businesses that are leveraging loyalty again to give back to customers and the typical view of 10% of off right there is a, a business called Pangaya who are instead of giving you 10% off they will plant a tree in return so that sort of engagement that you have instead of doing Black Friday we will give to charity a percentage of the amount that we give it's that sort of engagement and that sort of custom um, that customer relationship that brands are now building is, is becoming ever, ever, ever more important. Yeah, and maybe I can interject there just to give you a couple of, uh, of examples to build on uh, what Zach was saying. I um, So when I was at Pentland Berghaus, which uh, you may or may not know, it's like an activewear outdoor brand, mm -hmm. um, you know, along the lines of Patagonia, sadly not quite as, as big, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, very, very loved and, and loyal following. But we, I ran as, I used to run a sort of an incubation team where we would start to incubate, you know, it, kind of what we call kind of ideas around white space areas. And um, obviously looking at how can we um, take sort of end of line product or off cuts from factories, that sort of thing. And what can we turn them into or recycle um, clothing that have been sent, been sent back. And, you know, we, we did actually come up with some very, very simple products that we sold just online, online only. It was very much a kind of a test and, uh, you know, sold at a discount, money went to charity, all that sort of thing. 
it was massively successful. The appetite is hugely there and it actually drove, um, you know, some of the repositioning that Burke has, has uh, since done. I mean, it was always a, a pretty environmentally aware brand, but um, I, I definitely think that although we're all here talking about e-commerce and commerce and technology, I don't know if there are any brand or any brand marketing people or marketing people in the call, understanding that positioning, where you want to position your brand and brand values actually has a massive bearing on, um, you know, product, tech, loyalty, all these things. Um, and that was, you know, something I learned actually from working across all of these brands at Pentland. Great. That, that's really interesting, Gemma. And I think, you know, it's your point around even start around marketplaces like, you know, Amazon is, is literally just opening its largest warehouse here in Ireland coming this Christmas, which will open up the whole marketplace angle for Ireland. Um, you know, previously you'd have to send it to the UK or Barcelona and all that. So there's, there's definitely opportunities there and also probably with other brands that, you know, retailers should be looking to explore as a, as a good trend. Um, yeah. Well, I can write a book about marketplaces alone. I could okay. talk all day long about that. So um, okay. if, anyone, if anyone wants to talk to me about it, get in touch. But I think it, it has benefits, but there's also risks to businesses with marketplaces. It's not for the faint hearted. So uh, yeah, I'm happy to talk about that another time. And, and then maybe Gemma, you know, in fairness, you, you touched on a few of your previous uh, people, um, employers. Is there others you feel are doing it really well out there now at the moment? Um, if you maybe give us a few examples. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it kind of depends on, on what we what we mean by well, I suppose. Uh, the, um, you know, if I think for me, I, I, you know, I'm massively biased because I'm really passionate about running businesses through that lens of, of customer experience and that being like the kind of anchor for everything else that you do, even like technical decisions and architecting everything. Like I'm very sort of clear on that in my own mind. So if I look at businesses that I think have come to that point, because it's extremely difficult to do it well, um, the ones that I really admire um, who kind of got it top to top to toe would be people like, I mean, I did mention Patagonia. I think they are fantastic um, because they understand their customer. They've got strong values and, and it, it, it's like, a you know, the, the sort of, uh, what's it called? The, the, the pink in a stick of rock, it runs right through them um, in that space. So yeah, in, in the apparel space, I think they're very strong. Um, is brands like in, in beauty. So I do quite a bit in, in health and beauty as well. Um, Sephora um, has a really, really interesting, I, I think they just do commerce everywhere extremely well. Their loyalty programs are, are, are really good. They've redesigned those recently. Um, I think, uh, actually, I think Boots does quite a good job, although Boots has gone through a huge digital transformation, but um, they they really understand their customers actually um who else would i choose i don't know if there's anyone here in the grocery space like i said i do a lot in grocery and um i i i think it, a lot of my customers are in europe so deles ahol deles is a very large european supermarket you probably you know in ireland you wouldn't have heard, they wouldn't cross you wouldn't cross your path but really worth looking at um, the Deleuze website for how they take a market position and a brand and a set of values and then execute that really brilliantly across a whole experience. Like I really admire what they do because it's just so hard. Um, so yeah, those are just a few. Okay. Good, good. Uh, Zach, you, you touched on a few earlier, maybe. Is there, is there any others you'd, you'd like to mention? Yeah, I think that Gymshark and, and Lounge Underwear have, have kind of led the way in in emotional engagement. One that I will always, always pick out and I always say is not, um, is not a, a master's customer, it's not bigging up, but actually is um, a business called Charles Tirrett. They're, uh, they're a UK suit manufacturer. Sure, and yeah. the, the, the thing that, that, that they have is they have a connected data set, which is something that I, I have, I've rarely seen working so, so well within, within businesses. Um, and, and when we talk about commerce everywhere, they're a really good example of that, right? So because, at that level and when you are purchasing and look, you, you always have to take into account when you think about 
accessibility and you think about customer experience, you have to take into account what they're buying, right? It's always a rarity. People, if you're buying your milk at the shop, um, and you, you rarely want to give a, a great amount of data, but when it's a suit or something that has a warranty or something that is a replenishable good of, of something of, of sorts, you want to share the data because it becomes important to you. And they're really, really good at doing that. So it starts off with originally a, a typical e-receipt, okay? But what they will do is they will manage to, things like events. So if you're buying a, 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 a something for, for a wedding or, or you're buying something for Christmas or for something along the lines of that, they will know to consistently keep you up to date. They're very, very good as well at the the, the, the offline mailings, right? Something which I think has, has transitioned over the years, right? I think if we think back 10, 15 years ago, post was such a regular occurrence. Everyone just got their post and they opened it. And now we're almost getting back to the stages where you get a brown envelope, you think you're either owing money or you're going to get some money back. And apart from that, you rarely get anything else in the post. So having that kind of tangible touch-led experience gives you a voucher that you can either spend online or in the store. is a really, really clever way of, of continuing to engage the customer. If I think about the new world and customers that we're working with, um, the new, some of the new technology that exists in, in retail stores and stores of the future, everyone will have looked into one of them or, or seen, seen many of them over the time. And we're doing some really, really, really clever stuff with Puma at the minute, where if you have their app and, and you're in store, it can recognize you through localization of that technology. And what you're able to do is, is we're now able to send um, abandoned uh, dressing room campaigns. So similar to an abandoned cart campaign that you would have on a, on a website, we can understand the products that you're taking into the dressing room. We can understand what you're trying on, what you're buying, what you're not. And again, from there, we're now able to take that data and pass that and send follow-up online communications from an individual store data and store behavior. And I think that's something which, if we're thinking of commerce everywhere, that really enables the, the engagement of customers across a variety of different channels. And it's quite a, it's, it's a unique way of, of, looking at, um, of looking at customers. And Zach, maybe just touch on, we, we chatted yesterday as well about uh, some of the other ways to merge in store and online because that can be difficult but you know you had one or two other examples as well of of um, other ways to do it no of, of course and, and look I will always caveat this because it, it depends on, a, on on every single brand and everyone has their their nuances but there there it's it's traditionally been quite difficult and and that happens because stores are not always opened at the same time which means they're probably running off of different pod systems or different sets of, of data and trying to consolidate that data and make that data accessible is, is very, very hard for businesses. And that is one set of data and trying to match it to your online data and so on and so forth becomes quite difficult. There are, there are a lot of new technologies now. E-receipts is one that a lot of our customers are now utilizing. Um, that actually really exploded through um, COVID-19 because it meant that there was less touching of, of paper and, and exchanging of those sorts of things, which is Definitely interesting, um, but actually one of the most simplistic ways and forms of connecting the data now is through barcodes or QR codes. Um, a lot of the systems and our system particularly has pre-built barcode generations that work with most POS systems now. So when someone comes in, they can just scan an email or they can scan something which has been given to them so that they can track that order and whether it be get a, a discount because of a, an, an email that was sent to them or a mobile or a push message. Um, or link it to a loyalty program, which is a lot of that in, uh, identification that, that people are really looking for now because they want to know the customer and, and understand the customer in more detail. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's a good point because I think, you know, a lot of retailers will have physical loyalty cards, but I think more and more consumers are not really carrying their wallet or purse with them. Uh, they have their phone though, so if you can either connect it with an app or even you know, have a simple, unique barcode in, in their email. I think that's a good point. Um, Gemma, maybe just back to you in terms of things coming over the horizon, possibly. Um, where, where do you see the next couple of um, trends coming? Yeah, I think, yes, it, it, it's a good point because obviously we're talking about trends that are kind of here and now, aren't we, that we were kind of getting to grips with even as they're upon us. Um, and, you know, that I, I think there'll always be an element of that. But, yeah, if you do look further, further ahead, 
the stuff that I think, you know, I'm certainly trying to learn about at the moment is things like you, you, you may have seen in the press that Facebook is hiring 10,000 people in Europe just to focus on its, its uh, developing technology around the metaverse, right? And, and sort of what that means, how, you know, that whole piece of kind of, you know, AR and VR, how is that going to be used in, in, uh, in our daily lives? And in, in probably, I say 10 years time, it'll be more like five years time. I think we're starting to get a glimpse of, of, of some of what's happening in that space now. Um, you know, things like, you know, non-fungible tokens and, um, you know, the way that uh, sort of digital art is, is acquiring a value. You're seeing some of the very high-end fashion brands and marketplaces like Farfetch, Burberry. They're really, they're, they're the ones to watch to see how they're experimenting with some of this stuff. Um, and then obviously watching what Facebook does um, in the space. You know, I, I, I'd be lying if I said I was an expert. I'm far from an expert. But you see, you see these big... Um, you know, tech giants move and you think, right, okay, this is, we need to pay attention because you can be sure they have a plan. Um, so that's, that's one for me. Um, I think beyond that, uh, you know, I, it's, there's a big, there's a whole, I think loyalty, I think is just going to continue to be something that evolves actually, not to labor the point, but, um, yeah. I, I do look at that and think that there are things happening in the loyalty space and, and actually in that kind of joining the online and offline consumer and driving loyalty, not through programs, but just through better understanding, that's going to become more and more sophisticated yeah. um, over time. And then all things related to fulfillment would be my third one. So, you know, last mile delivery, that whole space is still, is still evolving, is still moving very quickly. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah, yeah, no, it's good. That's good, Gemma. I think definitely the point around loyalty, like you see Tesco now have made a big shift. They're giving extra discounts with when you use your club card on top. And I think ASOS is revamping their program uh, as well. So, Zach, maybe from your side in terms of what, what do you see coming over the horizon? Yeah, so uh, look, I, I echo Gemma's thoughts there. I think Augmented reality is is going to be huge. I think um, Charlotte Tilbury, another customer of ours, that um, did their their virtual store, so you can now enter a store and you can engage with live associates that happen to be via a, a web form similar to this. But you can have a, a conversation with people and you can book in different areas of of their engagement. I think that's that's going to be huge, and I think that will give people the, the capability. Something that I think I don't think enough people think about but is absolutely going to happen here is going to be live stream shopping, right? China, Asia Pacific region have been doing it for many, many, many years. I saw something the other day about two influencers that sold three and a half billion dollars worth in two and a half hours of, of live streaming. It's, in, it's sensational in terms of the way that they engage with it. And I'm seeing more and more brands. There's a, I've seen one business which is solely focused on it. And I do honestly believe that that will become the, the way, right? I think if we think back 15, even today, you can still go on to the 24-hour shopping channels. You can still do that. But the thing that you don't do is carry a TV around with yourself. And that was why that existed. But now we have apps and we have Instagram and we have social apps where you physically can carry that around with yourself. And you can constantly be engaging and understanding and having those sorts of things. And I really think that that is going to be something if, if businesses are not, considering it or they're not getting on board or they're not thinking that it's going to happen they they really need to, to start to think about their positioning for that because it's a big opportunity and the first ones to adopt it will, will be the winners yeah i really agree with that and if i did just another small anecdote i was um when i was at pentland i ran a, a small team in china and so i used to go out there every so often and i remember the first time i went to shanghai seeing that sort of social commerce stuff happening on on i think it was weibo i can't remember now the site the 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 platform but i remember thinking wow this is coming this is really coming and i went back and sort of talked to my team and and at the agency that we have mediacom um you know and, and thinking we need to experiment with this stuff 
fast forward actually to kind of last week, LS, which was one of the brands that, that I ran, um, you may have seen it to get some good publicity. Um, so they're a kind of, you know, uh, youth kind of fashion brand, I suppose. Um, they ran, so Sara Larson is now, you know, she's a big Swedish singer. My, my daughter loves her. Um, uh, she's their ambassador. She did a concert which was live streamed on TikTok and all of the apparel that she and I think the other people on stage were wearing was you could purchase via TikTok and it was a massive success. So that's that's here, it's happening. Mm. I mean, how much money they actually made from it, I'm, I don't know, but I think in terms of actually proving the popularity of that approach and obviously TikTok as a platform is is huge and they're poised to really drive um you know commerce through that platform um yeah I I, I couldn't agree more I think that it's going to be massive yeah definitely we have a few of our own uh, Irish retailers one of them in particular up in Donegal does a, a Fiverr a f- Fiverr, five at five, they highlight five products at 5 p.m. every day, five new products. Right. And uh, the lady, the, the, the team member in, per, in question has become nearly an influencer in her own right, you know, right. Uh, which is great. But um, maybe Zach, just, and if anyone attendee-wise um, has any questions, feel free, you know, pop them into the Q&A box and we'll, we'll put them to the to experts um but zach maybe just touch on you know a lot of members will be using shopify and they'll be using uh clavio as their kind of email provider maybe you know talk to us maybe a bit about the difference then to or in you know in comparison to marsis and where you see the 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 um key key uh, points of difference yeah look i think it's um both lounge underwear and Gymshark are still Shopify clients, right? And I think it's it's a conscious decision when 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 you when you're a business that wants to look at that that next step, right? I think Clavio as a as a business, it's a an app on the Shopify app store for very very good reason. It enables businesses to get started with with marketing communications and do a little bit more than the Mailchimp's of the world. Um, the decision to to move to Amasis really comes from the business deciding that actually they want to create a true relationship with their customer as opposed to continually think about what I should send to the customer. And they really want to turn that around and allow the customer to be the person that um, that takes the content that they receive. So the way that our system is architected is really about shifting that focus back. So taking in and adjusting all of the different channels that exist. So we have your website personalization, your social integration, your email, your website push, SMS, and so on and so forth. But because it's integrated, it means that it's a single point of truth and it's a single view of the customer. And what that then does is it enables us to make sure that we're personalizing off of a single point of truth. So recommendations on social or an email or the the next purchase product, all of those sorts of things are are truly one-to-one to to the customer demographic. And um, this isn't a sales pitch by any means, right? But I think... As you mentioned, a lot of your customers are on Shopify and, and using Clavio. I think one of the biggest differences and step ups and businesses need to think about whether they use us or someone else beyond, the, beyond that. But really thinking, starting to think about the relationship and how they think about their customer data. So Clavio is great. It has customer lifetime value, which gives you a metric to understand the value of a customer over its lifetime. Right. But what it should be doing and the next stage of that is really understanding outside of lifetime value, how recently are they purchasing from me? How frequently do they purchase from me? What's the the total value? And and are they still engaged? Because someone that has a high lifetime value but has two years is really different. And the communication they should get is very different to someone that spent two and a half thousand euros yesterday. So it's about that engagement and understanding the customer. And that's what we mean about transitioning and changing your thought process and the customer to understand actually the customer should be paid. If they're engaging with you regularly, then they need to get more content. If they're less regular, then it's less content. And that's the focus that we put on it here. Yeah, that I think that's a that's that's a great point. And it kind of ties in with retail in general, you know, instead of looking at your overall sales figure for the day. You know, you should nearly be breaking it down by what's the average transaction value per per retail person, you know, whereas you're saying to look at your customers and 
terms of how frequently they're buying with you rather than their their overall uh, value, which I think is a great, great point, Zach, in fairness. Yeah, and if I could just jump in there, Keelan, to say that it, it completely changes everything when you put that, when you look at everything via that kind of customer lens, like, you know, it's not what are they buying or how much you're trying to, it's, it's you know, who's buying and then what are they buying and, and, and to what extent. I've seen some really interesting um analysis that that you know I've, I've done some retailers where we've actually looked not at necessarily the higher value customers who you know we all really want to retain um at, you know those consumers but trying to anticipate buying trends for that middle segment for example so they're you know they're not down the bottom where they're kind of dormant or it's going to be very difficult to kind of if you like move them up the pyramid but those in in the in, in the middle of the pyramid who were not necessarily you know, if you look at what they're buying, you can pick up trends, early kind of early leading indicators as to so what's being purchased and then use platforms like Amarsis to actually trigger further interest. Make sure you've got the stock first. Obviously, mm. that's that's the key thing, you know, and you've got the range and then you can actually start to trigger. And then, of course, the way platforms like Amarsis work is that it's sort of, you know, the AI then kind of um, adapts then to ongoing behavior. So I think like that's, it, it, it does change kind of how you think about your business when you look at it in that way, I think. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point, Gemma. Um, we might bring in Owen um, there now in a minute and uh, just bring him in for, for the final discussion. While we bring on Owen, Zach, maybe we touched on the other day about hidden loyalty programs. Maybe just describe that. That was a great point, which I think. Yeah, I think so. We, we, uh, our customers have, have been looking at loyalty and implementing standalone loyalty programs for, for, for many, many years. And one of the biggest requests that they had was if you can't integrate with other loyalty programs or if, if it's not perfect, can, can you build it yourselves? And we built a loyalty program that exists within our platform, within our capabilities that uses all of the rich data that Gemma was talking about uh, about 18 months ago, maybe 20, maybe two years ago now. Um, and what we've seen is, is some businesses that are, are very quick to launch their loyalty proposition. But anyone here, I'm sure it is on, if you don't have a loyalty proposition, I would imagine it is on the lips of, of, of the board or, or in, in the meeting at, at most of your, your conversations. The challenge that you have with that is once you've launched it, it's really, really, really difficult to go back, right? You think about what are we going to do? Are we going to have tiers? Are we going to have points? Are we going to have rewards? All of those sorts of things that once you've gone to the customer, it's really difficult to bring back. I was explaining to Keelan and, and talking to the guys the other day about actually it's quite fascinating to watch how many of our customers are buying our loyalty module, but running it as a we deem hidden loyalty. So they will create the tiers in their back end so we can see how many customers are at silver, gold and bronze and so on and so forth and how many customers have got different rewards and how they play into one another. But what they're not doing is advertising it to customers. So they're checking that it works and the rewards that they're doing, they're treating them as surprise and delight. So customers are still accessing the rewards and the gifts and they're getting 50% off their next purchase. And what they're doing is they're understanding whether the gift or the reward is actually attaining value for them. So they're trialing it without the customers knowing, testing it all on the back end before they then go live because they know it works for the customer. I think that's really impressive and something which which has held a lot of value for the, the brands that we're working with. Yeah, yeah, no, it's, that's really interesting, Zach. No, fair play. Um, Owen, welcome, welcome on board. Um, Thanks for having me. Yeah, no, great. Maybe give everyone just a bit of background, Owen, in terms of what you're offering here uh, launching here in Ireland, which which will be a lot of interest to Irish retailers. Yeah, that's right. Um, I think um, earlier on, Kevin mentioned in, in terms of the the commerce uh, offering from SAP, uh, Commerce Cloud. So that's the, the the sort of the existing, let's say, flagship commerce product from from SAP, kind of going back you know ten years or so. Now at the moment, uh, SAP are launching a new uh, product called Upscale Commerce. Uh, which I think is probably a, a pretty good fit. You know, it, it's an interesting product, I think, for, for, the, uh, for the, the attendees in this webinar, uh, specifically because it's targeting the retail sector um, and it's, it's B2C. So that's the, uh, the product itself. That, that's the, 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 the target of the product. So uh, it's, 
I think Zach mentioned Shopify. So it, it's probably something a, a little bit similar to Shopify in that it's a, a you know, what, what's being called a no code or a low code solution. So, <clears throat> excuse me, it's the kind of solution that you're, you're loading your, your products into it, your, your product descriptions, your, your product names, images, prices, that sort of thing. You're configuring the, the, the payment uh, you know, configuration for the, the payment provider or gateway. Uh, you do a little bit of customization of the look and feel, the logos, that kind of thing. And then you're up and running. So it's not really uh, in, in the same way as something like Commerce Cloud. It's not really a development uh, sort of project, but it's a much quicker kind of go to market if you want. Uh, it's also without that development and the development costs, uh, it's also got a very sort of low total cost of ownership. So uh, that kind of has a, you know, obviously benefits in itself as well, you know. Yeah. Um, it is a cloud solution from SAP. So SAP are taking care of the hosting. They're taking care of the security. They're taking care of the, the platform updates. In fact, I think there's a, a, a platform update that, that's sort of rolled out every two weeks for this particular product. So uh, again, the, 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 the technical side and the costs of, of the technical side in terms of, of hosting a, an e-commerce solution <clears throat> is also very low, you know? So mm -hmm. in, in terms, I, I think it's, I, I did hear in, in one of the, the videos that, you know, for, you know in, in terms of the comparable products in the market, that it has the, the lowest total cost of ownership. Uh, so, you know, it, it's certainly a, a product that's, um, you know, quite interesting, uh, but maybe on the other end of the scale to, to something like Commerce Cloud. So, <clears throat> Finos IT is a, a, you know, our, our focus until quite recently was, or, or still is, uh, Commerce Cloud. Uh, and I think, you know, because of, the, of that focus and, and our expertise in that area, uh, we were invited into this, this uh, early adopter program for, for upscale commerce. So, um, you know, we, we've been kind of looking into that and researching that quite a lot recently. Um, Great. That, no, in fairness, that's, that's super own because I think a lot of retailers, if they're looking at possibly changing, you know, that the quick, the speed of you know, getting live and that no code option, I think, um, will be really important uh, to them, you know, in, in terms of getting live and, and making sure they're maximizing as quick as possible. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, there's kind of pros and cons with it, obviously, you know, that the, if you want to have a very, uh, say, um, unique or customized sales process for something like that on your, your platform, uh, if you want to have a very, uh, say, um, complex um, landscape in terms of your backend systems that you're integrating it with, you know, you have a lot more, say, flexibility or power with something like Commerce Cloud, you know, mm -hmm. because you, you, with a, a, a tool like that, you can really kind of customize every single aspect of it. You can change everything, you know, mm -hmm. with these sort of smaller products the, or the, these, uh, I kind of think of them as black box products like like uh, Upscale Commerce, like Shopify, those kind of things. You're, you're somewhat, I mean, you're not completely restricted. Uh, you, you can create custom components and embed them into the web pages and you know, have them interacting with the other components mm -hmm. in the pages. There are backend APIs you know, with things like web services. So you can integrate them into your landscape to a certain degree as well. Um, but they're, they're kind of designed more, or at least they're intended more to be a sort of a, a somewhat off the shelf kind of product. I think um, I know that, that I'm kind of, I'm saying Upscale and Shopify in, in the same breath. Uh, I think Upscale probably has, uh, in my opinion, a, a few, uh, I'd say, advantages over uh, Shopify. I think apart from the, the, the cost of ownership, um, for example, it, it has a very sophisticated AI layer. So um, I think the, uh, the, the way basically that it works is that it's tracking all of the user behavior all the way across your site. So anytime a user is visiting a page or, or you know, uh, uh, buying a product, uh, looking at a certain category, that sort of stuff. All of those those clicks, those those page views, that kind of thing, are you know it, it's gathered, it, it's tracked, it's gathered in in the uh, in the upscale system. Mm -hmm. So you you as a sort of an administrator now, you, you can go into the, these admin consoles. You have these they call them mobigrams, where mm -hmm. you can effectively get a kind of a visualization of what these users are doing on your site, and uh, you know you can kind of optimize your your behavior. But what's interesting is that the AI layer also uses that data for, uh, you know, personalization, uh, recommendations, that kind of thing, uh, components like, you know, this, uh, uh, you might also be interested in these products. Yeah. So 
uh, you know, or, or for example, you go to a, a category page, um, the AI uh, based on, on what's happening, it, it can be segment based. So for example, uh, you know, males of, of a certain age, um, you know, with certain say interests or certain purchases that have kind of put them into certain categories, they are more likely to be interested in a certain set of products. So the AI can kind of pick that up and can, for example, reorder the, the 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 products that are listed under a category. So if you go into view a category, you see that the the products maybe that are best selling first. Now, best selling is just an example. It can be whatever way you want to set it up. But um, you know, you can you can really have that kind of um, dynamic aspect in terms of personalization and, and ordering, I think they call it AI sort, for example, uh, in your site, which I think is kind of something that, that maybe pushes it a little bit ahead of the, the you know, of the, the Shopify's and those kind of guys. So while I'm using both of those together, you know, in the same sentence, um, I, yeah. I do have a preference. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, no, no problem. Uh, Jamie, you want to, you want to come in there? Yeah, if it's all right for me to ask a question, I know I'm not yeah. technically in the audience, but um. Yeah. It's very interesting to hear hear you talk about uh, upscale and that level of detail because um, I've worked, you know, on Shopify, SAP Commerce Cloud, and, and you know, pretty, you know, probably five or six other platforms um, uh, from across the landscape. I wondered whether um, upscale caters for portfolio businesses. Uh, so you know portfolio brands which is that was a real yeah. challenge for me in my last well, role was finding a platform that was scalable that you could stand up quickly um mm -hmm. but that could cater for portfolios of brands but well, i think one of the things that's interesting uh, again with upscale is that when you you're buying a, an instance or a, you know of upscale you can host multiple sites underneath that so if for example you have a brand that you want to you know just say promote on its own or you know, even if you're just looking to declutter your your main site, you could set up a dedicated site just to, just to you know, uh, say, for example, with a, a portfolio or whatever. You, you could just have a site with that alone. So you know, there's no extra cost. There's nothing like that. It's and in fact, the administration is it's it's all pretty much the same. It's it's quite simple to do. Uh, and then that way, uh, you know, you can actually have a a whole collection of sites, uh, each of them potentially targeting, let's say, different brands. But it could be different. Um, you know, markets are different, whatever you want there as well. You know, that's, that, that's actually one of the, the kind of key areas and, and key frustrations that we have and, and I have across some of our, our Nordic regions specifically. So some of our, if you imagine the Nordics are, are not great, then they're not the biggest countries in the world. So they have to sell everywhere around them. So they probably need to have at any given time between four and 16 different languages just to, just to work within a, a couple of thousand mile radius of them right and what they have is is and, and what 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 they struggle with is certainly with shopify is the different instances of shopify that needs to work for internationalization mm -hmm. and that means that operational um efficiency really dies because you're having to duplicate tasks and efforts and those sure, yeah, yeah. what we have and, and there's a, a recent one with joy store who are an upscale customer and the masters and there's plenty of, of content about that they really needed that, right? They knew they had all of their markets coming out and they needed a simple way to work efficiently across all of those different market capabilities. So that's a, a really big sell of, of upscale, one of the key areas where I know there are strategic differences between Shopify and upscale is that internationalization. Uh, Zach, actually a question for you. I know that I saw the roadmap for upscale and I know in, I think it's in this quarter, there is a planned release of an integration between Upscale and uh, Emarsis. Yeah. Uh, and I just haven't kept up to see if it's actually live yet or not. And yeah, there, there is. It's in, um, it's in pilot phase. So, okay. so Joy, we're a, a pilot customer of ours, right? And we, we need more um, customers. As, as you can imagine, there is we need more customers on, on, on the upscale side for us to continue to, to grow. But it was one of our key, um, when we were acquired by SAP, in October 2020, it was one of the key areas that we knew was a big focus for us. So really getting that integration live. And look, we've, we've talked today about commerce everywhere. And we've talked about data and customer behavior and, and emotional connection. And the reality is all of it comes down to data. Right? It comes down to having the right information about the customer to be able to make the right decision, to be able to give them the right offer at the right time on the right channel. And really that, that seamlessness of data sharing is, is so vital. So that 
upscale and a master's connector is, is there and, and sharing that data in real time and amongst all of the other connected systems that we have. But that, that's a real key area for us. Yeah, that's great to hear. Um, I know, Gemma, you were talking about marketplaces, but I think um, one of the things I saw recently with Upscale was the it has a, an integration with um, Facebook Marketplace. So it can sort of out of the box, you can export your, your, your products, your categories, that kind of thing to, to Facebook and in such a way that when you know it's showing on users feeds and when they're coming through they can actually click through and buy the product without even having to leave and, and visit the, the the site you know so uh, i was kind of you know that's kind of a i suppose one of the biggest marketplaces in, in existence i would imagine at the moment right yeah, and I think, you know, I've definitely got a few battle scars from trying to integrate with other marketplaces from uh, my previous roles. So I think anything that allows, especially if you're a smaller or a medium sized brand, you know, what you're looking for is growth, right? You're looking for, for you know, growth at maximum speed. And so anything that plugs seamlessly into these new distribution channels, which is really what they are at the end of the day, um, is going to be powerful. Um, you know, I've done like, you know, it was literally like like a, a kind of crafting integrations in, in the past. And it was really painful with, with um, you know, the likes of Zalando and things like that. So anything that removes that for a, for a medium sized business, um, you know, or even a large one, actually, um, is going to be effective because what we all want to be doing is focusing on growing our brands, growing the connection with our customers and, and uh, you know, and doing the things that matter to them, not, you know, necessarily custom designing everything in the back end. That would be my personal point of view anyway. I'm all about pushing ahead, you know, so, um, sure, so yeah. Yeah, it sounds very good. And, uh, sorry, sorry, Owen, I might just, I'll, I'll try and wrap up in a, in a minute, but I might just go around uh, our table here just one last time, maybe in terms of final key takeaways um everyone maybe just would might give uh, the attendees some final key key areas to focus on zach if you want to go oh, first thanks start me first so so <laughs> no one else takes mine um i think i think mine is obvious which is if you're not starting with the customer then then you need to do that today right it, everything needs to be thought about from the customer's lens the businesses that strategically think about and what they want to do as opposed to what the customer wants are going to be the losers in, in the new generation that we are. Great. Super. Gemma? Oh, Zach, you took my one. You took my one. I'll build on it. I'll build on it by saying, I mean, it, it is true. I mean, you are kind of, you know, uh, you're talking to people who are completely kind of embedded in that whole way of thinking. But I think if you're not sure how to do it, um, that's the next thing, how how to approach it. Um you know, I think it's really finding out, talking to people like me or, or, or really just figuring out, you know, what are the, there, there are very clear approaches to understanding your customers and then reverse engineering everything back into then, you know, the platform, the processes, the technology, the people, all of that. And um, there are ways to do it that it doesn't become overwhelming. And I think that's what we all need to kind of almost like reskill in that now. I'm going to stop now and uh, yeah, let Owen give his his perspective on it. Yeah, um, I suppose it, it's kind of difficult to come up with the kind of that one little nugget of advice. <laughs> you know? uh, I think one of the things, uh, one of the, the, I think the mistakes that I've seen in a, in, a, in a few of these these projects is a sort of a uh, what's the best way to put it? Maybe a lack of active management of their their not just their their sites, but of their their strategy as a whole. You know that they they'll kind of you know say take a um, uh, like a web like if they're going for a commerce site, for example, and they throw it up and they kind of figure, okay, that's done. Let's just you know let it happen. But you know if you see, for example, from from Kevin's pr uh, presentation at the start, you know the, the 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 suite of products that are there to support these types of sales. I mean, there's a very good reason why they're there, you know, and it's, it's because the companies who are kind of doing this stuff successfully mm -hmm. are, you know, they are looking at things like the analytics, they are looking at the, the various different, um, you know, support tools and they're, they're constantly reacting and adapting, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, I think, you know, as I say, that the, one of the big the kind of mistakes that I've noticed in the past is, is that people are uh, seeing it as a kind of a once off and not a kind of a continually, uh, a, a continual evolution let's say in yeah. terms of their, their strategies and their, their investments yeah. yeah no that that's definitely a good point Owen all right to finish on and I think you know the amount of new online customers everyone's gained over the last year that's really important now to really work, continue to work 
and try and retain them and keep them engaged and and not just look at their lifetime value as Zach said that, you know you get a whole picture of them so um some some great points guys really appreciate it thanks for joining us today um i hope everyone found it a really interesting we're going to send an email out with the recording um tomorrow and with any info if anyone has any more questions feel free to come back to us or reach out to the guys on linkedin um and happy to assist and have conversations uh thanks kevin as well for for your quick update um so really appreciate there we got a nice comment in there peter flanagan furniture yeah uh, great member um so uh i think we'll leave it there guys thank you very thanks. much thanks for having me thanks zach thanks thank jenna thanks all thanks okay. kevin bye thanks guys